Right, so this week's video, I've just got to say, I probably won't be doing comments for a little while after the video goes live because at 2 p.m. today, I am actually getting married. As such, I will not be on my phone checking comments and I'll be getting married to my partner, Mrs. Plainly Difficult. Anyway, enough of that being said, let's get on with the video. This picture looks rather unassuming. The two men in the foreground are looking at what looks like a room of metal drums. The year is 1983, and these two men are observing a room full of deadly radioactive waste. This waste is the result of tons of contaminated water leaking out into the environment, of which it's still being cleaned up today. These two men are most likely Russian, as where this photograph was taken was in the Androva Bay nuclear waste facility in the Soviet Union. Welcome to Plenty Difficult. Today we're looking at the Andreev Bay nuclear disaster. Today's video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the information will be in the pinned comment below. Okay, so before we start, I need to say that this video is based very heavily on the important publications by the Bologna organization that investigated the disaster and its breakout report published in 1995. There will also be some information from the IAEA and other sources in this video. And as always, all these links will be in the pinned comment. Andrew of Bay. It is probably hardly a surprise if I was to tell you that the Soviet Union went in hard during the atomic age, as the East and West faced off against one another. During the 1950s, as it developed its nuclear power industry, the Soviet Union developed a number of nuclear-powered submarine concepts. The concept of a nuclear-powered submarine is very attractive to a navy, as it offers an almost unlimited range and endurance over its diesel-powered counterparts mainly due not needing to surface to recharge its batteries from the pesky old combustion engine. But I digress. The Soviet Union would in 1956 start testing its first nuclear propulsion reactor, which would lead to its very first service submarine, the November class in 1958. The Soviet nuclear navy would expand over the following years, but no matter how advanced the fleet's propulsion system may be, like everything, its success would be closely linked to its important maintenance programs. This was to be undertaken at Zapadnyana Lister Naval Base in northern Russia on its Lola Peninsula. The first part of the base was built interestingly by the Nazis in 1939 as part of the short-lived pact between the Nazis and Soviet Union. The area wouldn't see much develop until the 1950s with the advent of the Soviet Union's nuclear submarine program. The naval base has four main areas and I'm really going to butcher the pronunciation of the names here. The Malaya Lopatka, Andreeva Bay, Bolshela Lopatka and Lopitia. These areas were built up in the late 1950s and early 1960s. At the time, the nuclear fleet was developing much faster than the facilities required to maintain it. Construction was mainly done by untrained conscripts, with little design or concern regarding personnel safety or environmental protection. The work was shoddy and substandard, and it ran all the way through from barracks to nuclear handling facilities. Works were often rushed by their commanding officers who didn't want to fall foul and have a career shortening incident. The Andreev Bay facilities were brought into operation between 1961 and 1963 and was tasked with storing the waste nuclear fuel from the growing submarine nuclear fleet. Interestingly, unlike the other three areas, Andreev Bay didn't actually have any submarines based there. Instead, it is the Northern Fleet's largest nuclear waste and spent fuel depository. In the Soviet submarine fleet, fuel is replaced roughly between 2 to 10 years, depending on requirements. As the fleet matured, issues would be seen in fuel assemblies cracking, requiring more frequent replacement. 
refueling generated significant amounts of spicy material, both in fuel assemblies, liquid and particulate nuclear waste. And in some submarine types, it would even require cutting out a section of the submarine hull to access the nuclear reactor for refueling, which also increased the chances of environmental contamination. In the early years of the fleet, refueling was done in dry dock, but this would change to being done while still afloat, albeit in docking facilities. This again increased the general chance of radioactive contamination for the environment, but again, no one was really concerned about that. Now, the Andrew Bay facility covers an area of two hectares and is serviced from both road and sea. Specialised carrier ships deliver the waste material via its two piers. In addition to the pier, the site has multiple buildings, all pretty shoddily built, as I mentioned earlier before. One important structure was called Building No. 5. This contained the two spent fuel storage pools. It was opened in 1961 and expanded in the early 1970s. The building had a loading area with a crane for road delivered waste. It was constructed of concrete and the pools were rectangular and the inward walls were lined with steel plates. Each pool is 60 metres long, 3 metres wide and 6 metres deep, with a total volume of around 1,400 cubic metres, weighing 1,400 tonnes. The entire building itself is 70 metres long and 18 metres high. The spent fuel is meant to be fully submerged in water, which is purified and monitored from separate buildings. Building 5 was designed to hold 2,000 spent fuel casks. But over the years, the gaps between the casks were reduced and this allowed roughly 2,500 casks to be stored. They were suspended in the pool with geometrically placed chains that stopped the risk of them toppling and to keep a safe distance from one another, as to not cause a criticality event. But this method of storage was very susceptible to the casks falling to the bottom of the pool. The plan with the casks was for the fuel to eventually go to Mayak for reprocessing, thus making Andrew Bay a holding site of sorts. Now the casks were made of steel and weighed roughly 350 kilograms, with a capacity to hold either five or seven fuel assemblies. But they were not designed to stop gamma radiation completely, hence needing to be submerged in water. The casks, when filled with spent fuel, are also then filled with water themselves, and this was to aid in heat distribution. The water within the casks was not intended to mix with the water within the pools. The water within the casks was to be removed at Andrew Bay before shipping to Mayak. So maintenance, criticality, controls and contamination prevention was all pretty awful at Andrew Bay. By the 1980s, after its early 1970s expansion, Building 5 was looking pretty neglected. Security was limited to just some broken fencing and a couple of guards, and the building itself was falling apart. Reportedly, the sky could be seen through the cracks in the roof, and multiple areas of the building were heavily contaminated. Which leads us on to 1982, and one big old nuclear waste disaster. 1982 all of the following information about the disaster came out 10 years after the event when it was leaked via, excuse the pun, Bologna. It is February 1982 and staff at Building 5 have noticed something slightly odd. The water in the right hand pool was lower than usual. Normally it should have a 4 metre depth to the top of the casks, but today it's lower. This was indicating that there was a leak. The base chief of staff had a brilliant idea for stopping the seeping water. How about pouring in some flour? Yes, that's right. He ordered flour, the stuff he used to make bread, to be poured into the pool, which would hopefully clog up any leak. 20 bags worth would be emptied out into the water. And did it work? No, of course it didn't. The leak continued. Maintenance staff noticed ice forming on the outside wall right by the right hand side pool. Interestingly, the ice being made by the cold February air was being fed by the leak. So they knew roughly where the leak was and concluded that the metal cladding in the pool must have failed. However, finding the exact location of the leak and repairing it would require diving into the pool to conduct a survey and of course do the remediation works. But this clearly was not an option as it would have been a death sentence for anyone who would have done it. 
The leak continued on spilling radioactive water into the surrounding environment. Water had to be kept on added, as, you know, allowing the cast to be exposed would be unpreferable. Fast forward to April 1982, and the leak increased from a dribble to a more noticeable flow rate of 150 litres per day. The levels of background radiation was at 1.5 ronkens per hour and testing of water runoff from a nearby brook and the building's basement showed elevated radiation levels. The next plan was to fill the basement with concrete, but again, the flow of water continued. This was in August 1982. In September, the loss rate of water had gone to 30 tonnes per day, flowing out into the area around the building. It was becoming ever more difficult to maintain water levels. Thus, threaten the cask's cooling ability and increase the chance of contamination of the wider bay area, a plan was posited to create a protective cover for the right-hand pool made of concrete, iron and lead, in an effort to try and stop the potentially catastrophic release of gamma radiation. On the 5th of October 1982, the plan was approved by the Northern Fleet Commander. In addition to the cover, water purification systems would be sorted out and the left-hand pool would be emptied completely of its fuel casks. A new liquid storage tank would also be built for this project. On top of that, the site around Building 5 would be extensively decontaminated. In November, the work to build the cover began. Thousands of tonnes of iron, concrete and lead slabs were placed over the tank. But things would take a turn. The, at the time not leaking left tank, began to do just guess what. It began to leak. It was dumping water at a rate of 10 tonnes per day. The sudden leak was thought to have been caused by the extensive building works over the right hand pool, disturbing the fragile lining. In December, the building was showing signs of distress with the added weight from the shielding. All of the water had escaped into the local water board out of the right hand pool and the left pool was still leaking, albeit now at a lower rate of 3 tonnes per day. They continued to pump water into the left hand pool and covered some of it with shielding material. A year after the initial leak, the Navy decided to cease storage at Building 5 and thus the next stage of emptying the left pool began. This would prove to be tricky. Over 20 casks over the years had fallen off their chain supports and had landed in awkward, unrecoverable positions lying on the pool floor. This had allowed fuel assemblies to fall out. The original as designed method of cask removal by Crane was not viable and thus they were just left there. As the retrievable casks were removed, they were from June 1983 stored at a repurposed concrete underground chamber for dry waste storage. However, not all the casks were intact, thus creating another radiological issue. Part of the creation of the dry tanks required breaking the previously installed concrete tops. This allowed rainwater to fall into the tank and as the casks were placed in the dry tanks, they pushed the water out, which after some time had come into contact with the broken casks, thus pushing more radioactive material out into the atmosphere. Plus the process of retrofitting the tanks to dry away storage didn't actually involve any shielding at the base, thus allowing this radioactive material to dissipate into the ground. Any loose material was shoveled into the dry tanks, which caused localised small criticality events, with Cherenkov glows being a common sight. Metal shields were used to protect workers loading casks into the dry storage. Over the next six years, the casks out of the left pool were removed, with some stored at the dry storage site and others being sent to Mayak for disposal. The remaining contaminated water in the left pool was drained into a nearby water storage tank. All whilst the recovery of Building 5 debacle was being undertaken, the Soviet subfleet still needed to be refuelled. As such, more spent fuel was being staged at the dry storage tanks, which by the 1990s had numbered three, named 2A, 2B and 3A. These three tanks for over a decade were exposed to the elements, just being outside, albeit buried, but eventually a building would be built over the top of them to aid in the cleanup works and to hide them from any prying eyes. The three dry storage tanks had an estimated 22,000 spent nuclear fuel elements inside. This was both from Building 5 and the additional fuel added from the naval fleet. 
It was thought that over 600,000 tonnes of contaminated water had escaped into the ecosystem and the Barents Sea. On top of that, it is estimated that six tonnes of spent fuel is stored in the Andrew Bay. Interestingly, this is way more than what was in Chernobyl Reactor 4, representing a much larger radiological risk when you think about it. Over 1,000 workers were involved in the disaster, and no proper log of exposures was kept, meaning that the human ramifications of their exposure were not really known. The Aftermath So the danger Andrev Bay represents is still very much there. The cleanup operation slipped into gear in 2017 with funds from Canada, Europe and the Russian government. Spent fuel was removed via a crane which was built into the building covering the dry storage tanks. In 2017, 18 batches of spent fuel were transported away. But as the war started in Ukraine after the Russian invasion, fuel recovery had ground to virtually a halt with only two batches being removed between 2022 and 2023. But winding all the way back to 1982, what caused the right hand Paul's initial rupture? Well, officials had a few theories, as stated in the Bologna report. 1. Poor quality of weld seams in the siding. 2. Shifts in the rock formation on which the building was erected could have caused the weld seams to crack. And 3. Drastic water temperature fluctuations that led to weld seams to sustain thermal stress and consequently disintegration. I mean, all three of those probably combined had some play in the disaster, but the common thinking is that the temperature changes was the cause for the weld failures, which is probably likely as the quality of the welds were very poor due to the whole untrained conscripts being used for constructing almost every part of Andrew Bay. On top of that, in the early days of Building 5, it wasn't temperature managed, meaning the pools would often freeze over in the some minus 15 degrees centigrade temperatures. The ice was eventually melted using steam, which then remained pumped into the pools. Thus, once the welds had gone through enough stress cycles of cooling and heating, failure was pretty much inevitable. The Russian Arctic is thought to be one of the most contaminated places on Earth. Well, over 600,000 tonnes of radioactive water would definitely do that. But on top of that, many submarines were just left in the bay once they became obsolete, with some leaking diesel fuel and others still having their reactors fueled up, exposed to the elements, abandoned and unchecked. The whole Zapadania Lista naval base area is toxic, even to today. So believe me when I say you wouldn't want to go swimming in the icy waters. Now that's my video on the Andrew Bay disaster. I've included all the Bologna links in the pinned comment for you to all check out as there's so much there, much more than I could even imagine to cover on a plainly difficult video. So it's scale time. As I don't really know the death toll, I don't really know what it's going to be. But if we're talking about contamination, then it's definitely going to be a 9. And this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently mild corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, can you do me a favour and play me out, please? <laughs>